I'm hoping that you picked up one of the outlines on the table and the bulletin. Uh, we'll be going through uh, the last message that um, kind of came to me when I was basing the, uh, some of the scenes from my favorite Christmas movie. If, if you didn't know that, sorry. I put this on. Thank you. Polar Express. Um, now, someone asked me, I think, uh, am I going to be doing... Uh, a, a, a movie series all the time, like, for example, based upon the Hallmark movie, you know, Christmas movies that I've been watching with my wife? And the answer is no. Okay, just no. But anyway, let's look at uh, a scripture that uh, is often missed because the book of Jude uh, doesn't really have a chapter. It's, it's actually just uh, 25 verses. Um, so when you say chapter one of Jude, there's no chapter two. But I have to put it up there because some of the Bibles actually have chapter 1. Jude is a very interesting book. It's stuck in there in the New Testament. Very short book, but very powerful in its theology and its words. So let me just uh, read this to you, verses 17 to 23. If you have it in your uh, phone or you have, it in your, if you have your Bible there, turn to Jude chapter 1, 17 to 23. Let's look at that. Dear friends, remember... What the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. And this is what they foretold. In the last days or the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. Sounds familiar? Could have been any century of the last 20 centuries, 21 centuries. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, who do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire to show others mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. This is the charge at the end of his little letter, that we as Christians, we have the greatest hope for the world. We have the greatest gift for the world. God has given us so that we might give to others. Now I want to pray and then we'll get into our, our message. Father God, just thank you so much for this time. And I pray, Father, that you would just... Um, Bless us. And again, Lord, I think of uh, how we can share uh, our faith through stories that are evident in our world today, even fictional stories that are evident in our world today, and how we can share the truth of your love for us through these uh, fictional stories. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon this message in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yeah, I grew up in Philadelphia, by the way, and, and when uh, I was uh, focused as a little child uh, on uh, Christmas Eve at four and five and six years old, I was told that the only real Santa Claus was the one that was in Macy's Day Parade, because they made such a big deal about it. The ones at the, you know, department stores, they were, they were always called Santa's helpers, and, 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 and you know, I... I I fully trusted my parents, and I, I believe that. And I enjoyed that time uh, of childhood. And, and, and then I moved on, and I remember a song um, that uh, came out. And I, I want to say that sometimes seeing isn't always believing, because I did go to the Macy's Day Parade. And seeing isn't always believing. And there was a song that came out um, by a ska band in the, uh, in the 80s or 90s. I guess it was the 90s. And the ska was uh, popular back then. And it was called So Many Santas, But Only One Lord of All. And I really believe that we have a connection. Those of us who know Jesus as Savior and Lord, we have a connection with that one Lord of all. Uh, I guess I, I play that a little bit loud sometimes at my house, and my wife uh, does turn it down, but I, I still like that song. 
Uh, as I was uh, growing up, there were skeptics that came at me, and when I told them about my belief in the, in the big man in the North Pole, they emerged proving to me that, that just waiting up for Santa was fruitless because maybe he doesn't exist. Maybe he's this or maybe he's that. And actually, we live in an age of skepticism. We live in a, in a place where uh, people are skeptical beyond measure. And their skepticism keeps them dissatisfied with anything that anybody says. Look at the last uh, election. We were so skeptical about everything that was said. And we were always in this uh, anger, dissatisfaction, even with the medical world and when it comes to coronavirus. We're skeptical. We were, we're, I think we've been trained to be skeptical. And, it, and, and this leads to some dissatisfaction because we want what we want and we want it now and when people can't give it to us, then we question everything and we become very dissatisfied. Bill Bryson uh, wrote in a book, he said, and this book was entitled, I'm a Stranger Here Myself, about changes that he saw when he returned to America after being in Africa for 20 years. He wrote this in that book. He said, the abundance of choice not only makes every transaction take 10 times longer, as long as it ought to, but in a strange way actually breeds dissatisfaction. The more there is, the more people crave. The more they crave, the more they, well, crave more. You have a sense sometimes of being among millions and millions of people needing more and more of everything constantly, infinitely, and unquenchably. Does that sound like America, by the way? Did you ever think about uh, what kind of gift you're going to buy your, your spouse or what gift you're going to buy this person or that person that has everything anyway? Isn't, isn't that a trial? And then you go, to, you go to these stores and they have 25 gifts that you give for under 20 bucks. And you end up buying something that really... They're going to look at it and say, oh, okay. And they're going to crave for something else. Being skeptical and being dissatisfied seemed to go together. Um, I have said that there are things that you cannot see that can truly satisfy your life. There are things that you cannot see that can truly satisfy your life. And when we think that buying things or giving somebody something will satisfy them, that's not going to happen. I've lived long enough to know that, and you have lived long enough to know that. Things don't satisfy. What things can you not see that will satisfy? Or what kind of things do you not see that you cannot deny? And I want to look at this. And, and, you know, the question is, why are we so skeptical about the things that we cannot see? Because we do believe in things like ultraviolet rays. I just had another skin cancer cut out of me. Uh, ultraviolet rays are bad. Germs, viruses. We, we talked about the wind just a couple weeks ago, just to name a few. But there are many other invisible things that people believe in that you cannot see. In an old Gallup poll, 75% of Americans believe in the paranormal. 75%. Of this group, 41% believe in extrasensory perception, 37 in haunted houses, 37%, 32% in ghosts, 31% in telepathy, 25 in astrology, 21% talking with dead, and 20% reincarnation. They believe things they cannot see. And the question is, why? Why would you believe in this stuff? Seriously? They look at you and me and they say, well, you believe in a God you can't see. You believe in a Savior that died 2,000 years ago. You think he even existed? I mean, what's the proof, they say? And no doubt... I think sometimes we have a crisis of faith thinking maybe they have a point. Over the last few weeks, we've been watching scenes from the uh, Polar Express. 
and I want you to watch uh, this scene, okay? Christmas Eve run. I was up on the roof making my rounds, but I slipped on the ice myself. I reached out for a hand iron, but it broke off. I slid and fell, and yet I did not fall off this train. Someone saved you? Or something. An angel? Maybe. Wait, wait. Well, what did he look like? Did you see him? No, sir. But sometimes seeing is believing. And sometimes the most real things in the world are the things we can't see. Well, that's something to discuss. Yeah, I knew that was just going to come back. Uh, one of the things that uh, you can discuss when you watch this movie is that statement that the conductor said. Sometimes he, he says... The most real things in the world are things that we cannot see. Think about that. The most real things in the world are things we cannot see. Is that a true statement? Seriously. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a scientist. I work in the science world. I add sodium to chloride. I make salt. It happens every time I do it. I don't need things that I cannot see in my world of science, right? Well, then talk to a scientist about how an atom stays together. Talk about how an atom stays together. Here's these electrons spinning around a nucleus. How does that atom not blow apart? What holds it together? They're still trying to figure that out. They know that if they cut an atom in half, there's energy that is enough that will level Watertown, but they don't know how an atom stays together. There's theories about it. Molecular theories are abounding. They can't see an atom. They don't know how it holds together, but they believe in atoms. in the world is more important that we cannot see. Believing in things unseen, by the way, is what we all do. Skeptics, skeptics, scientists, atheists, they all believe in things that cannot be seen. And some of the things they believe in are the most important things in life. How about this? How about faith? How about hope? How about joy? How about devotion? How about love? Undeniable, powerful things that we cannot see that are some of the most real things in the universe. Such treasures cannot be bought. They cannot be sold. They cannot be boxed. They, 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 even with a ribbon at a department store, they cannot be purchased, nor can they be denied. Apparently, the conductor on the Polar Express <laughs> is actually correct. If we can accept the reality of these invisible attributes that are so real, then we're not that far away from accepting a God who loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us because we can't save ourselves, and we know we can't save ourselves. We've tried. As a matter of fact, Jen and I are trying a new diet for 2021. We're going to do it this time. Have you ever heard that before? We can't save ourselves. Only the God who created us can save us. We all believe, by the way, as I said, even the skeptics, even the atheists, all believe, they all live by faith. They all live in something, they, and they believe in something they cannot see. You know, there's been a turnaround, and uh, there's research that approved this. Some of it's old research that I looked at, but it was also quoted in U.S. News and World Report and in Newsweek and in an extensive study by UCLA 
about 112,000 students uh, in college and universities, they found that over 80% of those students in referencing um, spiritual things and things they cannot say believe in God. 81% actually attend religious services. 64 say their spiritual life is a source of joy. Now, this is old research. I don't know what we would find if we looked at 2020 research. Maybe things have really drastically changed. But their spiritual life, they're looking for something to explain their feelings. They're looking for something to explain the why of life. And some of them have stopped looking and some are still looking. Let me uh, look at a verse of scripture with you that we've looked at before. Many of you know this. Uh, and of course, how do you use your faith muscle is the question of these students. And how do you use your faith muscle is the question of the day. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We looked at it before when we talked about believing in things unseen. Hebrews says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Faith is being certain and sure about things that we cannot see. Are you really in love? Yes, I am. Come, come, all right, let me see your love. Show me your love. What? How can I show you my love? You know, I, I don't love this person. No, I want to see your love. Well, I can demonstrate it. No, I want to see the actual feeling of love. Now, by the way, uh, Pixar can do that for you in animation. You know, they, they have that little bouncy heart, you know. Um, they could show you that in Pixar. But these are unseen things that you are certain and sure of. And Hebrews says that's what faith is all about. To be certain and sure of the fact that Jesus loved you and died on the cross for you and saved you from your sins. And we could be certain and sure of that. That's not a wishy-washy hope. That's a, that's a solid hope. We're built on a solid foundation of truth, God's truth. So faith, faith is being sure and certain. Look what Acts chapter 11, verse 21 says. It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Look at verses in the, in the book of Acts as the word of God was being pre uh, preached, the, the people were gripped by the Holy Spirit and moved to believe. Something that they never even thought of. Something that they weren't convinced of by a lot of logical reasons, but they were moved to believe in the truth. This is, this is a great verse for all of us who, who um, worry about our loved ones who maybe are still outside of Jesus Christ. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified, and they glorified, excuse me, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as has been appointed to eternal life believed. Whoa! They glorified the word of God. They, they heard the word of God. They, I'm, I'm believing that they were convinced of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we looked at that in uh, John 16. The conviction of the Holy Spirit was on them. And they were appointed for eternal life, so they believed. They had an appointment with God. You know, by the way, we have appointments with doctors, and we wait in the waiting room for an hour and a half, two hours, and we keep wondering if they know that we have an appointment with them. But God had an appointment with these Gentiles. I have an appointment with you, and they believed. God entered in to their lives, the Holy Spirit brought the conviction, and somehow the Holy Spirit and our heart worked together so that I would one day trust Jesus as my Savior and Lord. I had an appointment with God. Wow. So faith is being sure and certain, but God is also on our side and moving us to that faith. Being appointed for eternal life. I want to look at this, being Sure and certain is being appointed for eternal life, being glad and honoring God's word, knowing that the Lord God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the truth of Scripture, even in the darkest of times. And by the way, one of the blessings of a pastor 
is to go into a hospital and see somebody suffering a horrible cancer or disease that they know they're going to die of, and being encouraged by that person in the bed saying, you know, Pastor, I'm so happy you visited me. How are you doing, Pastor? What can I pray for you, they say to me. And I look at them and I go, and they're just waiting to go home to be with Jesus. That's what our faith does. Our faith changes our perspective. It's sure and certain. It's knowing that the Lord is with us no matter what happens. Now, do we all slip and fall? I love the, the kid slipped and fall, and he was grabbed. And then, of course, the conductor had his story. Do we, do we all slip and fall? And the answer is yes. All of us slip and fall. All of us have difficulties in this life. And sometimes we're not always faithful. But Jesus is always there to catch us. He wants us to be on the train to glory. He wants each one of us to make it home even more than we sometimes want to make it home. I love the way uh, Jude ends. And by the way, if you have your Bibles open to Jude, you know this passage very well because it's a benediction. In Jude 24 and 25, it says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. To keep, the word is stumbling. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. See, God is able. Jesus is able. He wants to pick you up. And he wants to take you home one day. Do you have faith that he will be doing that? Do you have faith that he can do that? Uh, Moses uh, Bittock celebrated becoming a U.S. citizen. And that would have been enough for the uh, Kenyan-born native. Uh, but he was, on to, uh, uh, he was on his way from the federal building after being sworn in as a citizen of the United States. And Bittock stopped at a gas station to see the winning numbers of the hot lotto game. Uh, and he found out the same day that he became a citizen of the United States that he won $1.8 million in the lotto. And he said this. He says, it was almost like you adopted in a new country, and then they give you $1.8 million. It doesn't happen anywhere else, only in America. Listen to me. When you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, not only do you become a citizen of heaven, and that should be good enough, right? I'm a citizen of heaven, and, and that's, you know, some people say that's the far away, by and by, it's probably only a few years for me, but, you know, for you, maybe you think in 40 years from you. No, you've inherited billions of dollars because you have brothers and sisters in Christ all around you. All around the world, you have brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who will invite you in. You could stay at their house. I know because I've done that. And uh, eat their meals. And they will even give you money to help you on your way. And you don't even know that because you can't see them. They're the unseen family of God that you have. Do you believe it? Do you believe you have that family? I'll tell you, I believe it, and I have banked on it sometimes. I have banked on it when I was out of money in Ohio and I was out of gas, and I banked on it. We are just like Moses, Bittak. Not only do we become a citizen of heaven, but we inherited the family of God. Amazing. What does it mean to be a Christian? Joseph uh, Roy in Leadership Magazine wrote this. Joseph Roy said, a true Christian is a sign of contradiction, a living symbol of the cross. He or she is a person who believes the unbelievable, bears the unbearable, 
forgives the unforgivable, loves the unlovable, and is perfectly happy not to be perfect, is willing to give up his or her will for another, becomes weak to be strong, and finds love in giving it away. If that's not your definition of Christian, then you're missing out on the Christian faith. You're missing out on what it means to be loved by God and to do his will. It's a royal royal ride to live for the king of kings and lord of lords. There's an account of Jesus healing a a blind man. And and the blind man sees in chapter 9 of John. And by the way, as I'm studying through John, I'm actually reading and talking to you about John. But you'll be hearing these sermons in the next weeks to come. The disciple asked about this man, who sinned that made this man blind? And Jesus answered, no one sinned, but that the work of God might be displayed. And then Jesus makes some mud with his saliva, puts it on his eyes, and all the girls in the Sunday school class go, ooh, and tells the man to wash it off in the nearby pool. The man is healed, and when he is questioned later, he, he he says this, whether Jesus is a sinner, I do not know, but one thing I do know, that though I was blind, Now I see. What did he see? Was it just that his eyes went from darkness so that he could see the trees? That's what we're thinking. But you know what? I think he saw Jesus as the Savior of the world. And that's the scene that you and I need to see. What keeps a person from seeing when they have spiritual blindness or keeps us seeing the reality of Jesus' love and his power to heal us when we are in darkness and we think there's no such thing as God. Spiritual blindness must be overcome. I want us to look at uh, one more scene, and it's about belief. And, you, and, and I want to answer the question, <laughs> how does one believe? Now, every story is different, but let, let's watch this scene, okay? I mean, here we go. What was that you said? I I believe. I believe. I I believe. This is yours. I believe. I believe. The bells were ringing all around him. I don't know if you saw the movie. The bells were ringing all around him. He couldn't hear them. When did the boy 
hear the bell? Before or after belief? Come on, guys. When did he hear the bell? Before or after? After he believed. You may have noticed that everybody else was cheering about the bells. And if you watch the movie, they're all cheering and having a great time, but he cannot hear the bells. Though the bell was always ringing, the sound of all the bells was there, that he couldn't hear it. Everybody else was having a cheering time hearing the bells, but he couldn't hear it. The boy had ridden the train of exploration, the Polar Express. He pondered the question of his fellow travels. He heard the convictions of those who believed. But at some point in time, a decision had to be made to believe. You know, I don't know if you uh, remember Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a great evangelist of, of, of this last century, and and uh, Billy Graham had a magazine. Does anybody remember the title of the magazine that Billy Graham? Do you remember, Hope? Decision Magazine. When Billy Graham would preach, the first thing he would say is, you are going to make a decision tonight. You're going to make a decision tonight. He said, one way or another, you're going to make a decision to believe or you're going to make a decision not to believe. I was trying to grapple, what makes a person make the decision? God's conviction comes on people. God's conviction, they, they realize their life is a mess, and yet they walk away from a Billy Graham crusade, and they do not make the decision to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. Then there are those who come in, their life is a mess, and they do make the decision. There was a couple brothers that I, I, I grew up with and, uh, that were uh, at our church, Dave and his brother Donald. Dave and Donald, their, their mother died horribly of cancer in their childhood, I mean in their high school years. One of them was moved to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. One of them was moved away from the church and hated God for taking his money. Same family, same event, two different decisions. What makes a person decide? I don't believe anything makes a person decide. Everybody's story is different. I believe that God allows us the opportunity to decide, not in a fictional bell from a children's story, but to believe the Christ of history. It's not a choice for or against Santa's bell, but a decision for Jesus to save us. Everyone makes the choice to believe or not to believe, to receive the gift of eternal life or to reject that gift. According to the Bible, Jesus is always the gentleman, always inviting, never forcing, always patient, not wanting anyone to perish. We just read that scripture a couple of weeks ago. He knocks on the door of our heart. He doesn't break it down. He's looking to be a friend of a sinner, not an enemy, not someone that's going to force you to do something that you don't want to do. He's a friend to you, and he's a friend to me. We need to remember that. Revelation chapter 3, and some of you know this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. I stand at the door. He doesn't break it down. He doesn't force his way in. And you know what, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm blessed by these scriptures because I can't make someone believe. I have somebody across from me from my desk, and they're asking me all kinds of questions. And I say, you need, you need to believe in Jesus as your Savior. And they say, you know, I can't believe. And I say, well, I'm going to make you believe. I'm going to force you to believe. Because I'm a pastor, and that's my job, to force you to believe. Right? They're all saying, no, you can't do that. Yeah, I can't. Can I present the logical arguments? Can I present the science? And sometimes I don't even use the Bible. Yeah, I know some of you guys say, well, you should use the Bible more. Sometimes the arguments are not even having anything to do with the Bible. I say to the person, you need to make a decision. And I got another appointment, so Sorry. 
And sometimes we need to make a decision to believe. When everything is going wrong, when the, we get fired from our job or we get furloughed or we get somebody in our family that has coronavirus or we get coronavirus, we need a decision to believe that God will never leave us nor forsake us just like he said. No matter what happens, right? And I've been really long today, so let me finish. And uh, Remember the father of the epileptic boy at the Mount of Transfiguration, when the disciples came down, Jesus came down, and uh, Jesus said to the man who wanted his boy healed, he said, everything is possible for him who believes, and immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help my unbelief. That's a good prayer, by the way. That is a great prayer. Let's bow. Father, that's what we sometimes need to pray. Help my unbelief. I see things in the world that distract me and my family, some things are happening in my family and I, I wonder if you're there hearing my prayers. I wonder if you're in control of this crazy world. I wonder where you are. I believe. Help my unbelief. Help me to stand again on the rock of my salvation. Help me to understand that no matter what the circumstances of life, I can trust you. I can rely on you. I can, I can know and be certain that you're with me and you will take me home someday. Father God, I pray for anyone who's struggling with their faith this morning. I pray right now that there's one person that uh, you need to reach down and touch their heart this morning. Or that is watching online. Lord, I just pray that you would touch them. As a matter of fact, I just pray that if anybody here or at home are just feeling it, that they would do something. They would acknowledge that, that they're struggling. I pray that they would raise their hand right now, Father God, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I pray that they would raise their hand if they're struggling in their faith. I, I see those hands. I see those hands. I, I pray for those who struggle. I pray that they would, they would rehearse the promises that you have. That they would realize the truth of the cross. And they would make a decision to believe. Thank you, Lord, for lessons from a secular movie that, uh, that can help us rethink what we believe in. We pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. All God's people said amen and amen. At this time, Pastor Justin. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for bringing the word. I'm Pastor Justin, the family pastor, if you can't recognize me behind the mask. Welcome to 2021. How many of you are optimistic that there are great things ahead of us this year? Wow. Okay. The rest of us are just too tired from 2020. Okay. Well... A few announcements uh, this morning. Uh, Bruce Pulse will be having a new adult connection class, but they will be meeting at 9.30 here at the church, not at 9, 9.30. Uh, the class is called How to Speak Joy. Um, reason it meets at 9.30, that way once they're done, you can go straight to the 11 o'clock service. Also a reminder, it is traditional when we have communion that we take two offerings, uh, but we don't actually have ushers that do that. We just now have the plates and the baskets out there as you leave. The plates are for the ministry fund. The baskets are for the benevolent fund, which we take uh, once a month during communion. Thank you for your generosity. Um, also, Christian Missionary Alliance is doing uh, 40 days of prayer. And they have, have a devotional online at cmalliance.org. Or uh, if you don't use the internet, or you just like to be one of those people that have it in your hand, we have printed some out there that you can take with you, and you can 
read the devotionals and pray along with uh, hundreds and hundreds of other Alliance people as we begin this year. There's going to be a new prayer time on Wednesdays at 6.30 that Pastor Mike will be leading. Uh, you may want to be a part of that. And finally, we have membership class at 6.30 uh, or 8.30 on the 7th and the 9th. You only have to come to one of those two. If you're interested in membership, there is a sign-up out there to let us know that you are coming. Uh, and we would appreciate uh, the, the heads up that you're coming uh, so that we can make preparations. Well, whether we wanted it or not, we are in 2021. And the God of 2020 is the God of 2021. And he has kept us this far, and I believe that he will keep us in 2021 as well. So with that,